Welcome to Lecture 8 for the Historical Books, Bright Old Testament 510. We're continuing our way through 1st and 2nd Kings, focusing today primarily on 2nd Kings, which is a book that really goes from bad to worse, and then, well, ultimately, the worst. That's where we're headed, so let's dig in. 2nd Kings chapters 1 and 2 are a transition from Elijah to Elisha. We see the passing on of Elijah's spirit, a double portion to Elisha, and then Elisha performing a bunch of miracles indicating that the spirit of Elijah has passed on to him and that he is now the prophet in Israel. However, 2 Kings 1-2 through 2 is also a time of transition from bad to worse, as we see the end of chapter 2 where Elisha is mocked even by little kids. The fact that Elisha is a prophet is at stake here. Uh, the people are making fun of him as being bald and cursing a prophet. They know he's a prophet, and yet as these boys are making fun of him, they're demonstrating the fact that they're willing to make fun of even a prophet in Israel. Prophets have lost all respect because the people of Israel have gone so far away from God that mocking a prophet of God doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. And so as random as the story may seem, it actually makes a lot of sense because it shows the depth to which Israel has sunk. Chapter 3 is interesting in that we begin to see a number of revolts against Israel as the various uh, enemies of Israel begin to throw off the chains, as it were, the oppression that they've experienced at the hands of Israel, having been conquered by David, and then that conquering having been sustained by Solomon, but now as the nations are beginning to gain more power and Israel is beginning to sink in power, those nations are beginning to rise up. What's interesting also in chapter 3 is that we see Elisha being asked a specific question by Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. Uh, the king of Israel and the king of Judah are deciding to go out and fight against the king of Edom. Uh, they begin to say, we need to find a prophet, and that prophet happens to be Elisha. Elisha seems to be traveling with the army, and they go to Elisha and they ask him a question, and Elisha asks for a harp to play. This is interesting because this is the first time that we've seen a prophet having to get in the mood, as it were, for prophecy, having to do something in order to aid the process. This is a development, although it doesn't continue in Israel's history, because we don't really see prophets doing this uh, much else beyond this. The only other time that we've really seen this was when Balaam was trying to manipulate the word of God. But here, Elisha seems to be doing the same thing, putting himself in a state of mind where he can hear the prophecy of God. Uh, the attempt is successful. He does indeed hear the word of God, and he does pass it on to the kings. But at least in terms of our understanding of prophets and prophecy, this is rather unusual. We've gone from prophets who are court seers or are wise men in the courts like Nathan and Gad to prophets that perform miracles as they're proclaiming the word of God. And now we've got a prophet who is actually putting himself into some sort of trance or some sort of meditative atmosphere so that he can hear the word of God. So we're continuing to redefine prophecy as we continue through the book of 2 Kings, as we're seeing these differences through what we might expect of, as a prophet, and yet we don't see it continue beyond the books of 2 Kings. By the time we get to the minor prophets, it seems to have shifted so that actually the type of prophet that Elijah and Elisha are is actually looked down upon, probably because it was abused. So this is the beginning of the idea of prophets and hearing the word of God, manipulating the word of God, although that has a pejorative sense to it, but doing something in order to allow themselves to hear the word of God. That then was abused by the court prophets for the next several uh, decades, even centuries, as these prophets would try to put themselves into some sort of trance so that they could hear the word of God, but they ended up being false prophets so it doesn't quite fit the scenario. They're trying to copy what it is that Elijah and Elisha did. In chapter 4, we begin to see somewhat of a deja vu because we have Elisha doing the same things that Elijah did, still performing miracles, still feeding people, and still raising a young boy from the dead. Again, this is still demonstrating that we have shifted from Elijah to Elisha. 
In 2 Kings chapter 5, we read about Naaman, the Aramean commander of armies, and his leprosy. By the end of the chapter, the leprosy will actually stick to Gehazi, the servant of Elisha. Gehazi goes and lies to Naaman. Naaman had tried to offer money and other things to Elisha in exchange for healing. Elisha had turned them all down. Gehazi, though, sees an opportunity, lies to Naaman, and says, actually, we will take some of that money and those garments. Elisha tells Gehazi that Gehazi will have the leprosy of Naaman now for all of his succeeding generations, which indeed takes place. We also see in chapter 5, in verses 17 and 18, an admission by Naaman that he's going to have to go into a pagan temple to worship with his superior officer. In verse 19, Elisha says, go in peace, which would suggest that that is indeed okay and that he's forgiven, although some scholars take it the other way and say that this is Elisha basically avoiding answering the question, basically saying to Naaman, Naaman, you're an idiot to think that it's going to be okay to go worship in a pagan temple when you're now claiming you worship the God of Israel. Scholars continue to debate this, and really either one could be defensible from the text, although I tend to lean a little bit more towards the idea that Elisha is saying you are indeed forgiven, which again, especially in light of New Testament teachings related to the sacrifice of meat offered to idols, is perplexing and rather odd, in fact even seems somewhat contradictory. However, it does appear that that's what Elisha is telling Naaman, that yes, God understands when you have to bow down in a foreign temple because you're with your superior officer. In chapter 6, we see the situation go from worse to worst. We see what looks like the story of Solomon and the two women with their baby trying to figure out who the baby belongs to. Only here, instead of there being a dead child and an alive child and trying to figure out who the live child goes with, Instead, the mothers were in the process of eating the baby. They ate the one baby, and then when they went to eat the second baby, the mother hid it. This really shows how far Israel has declined since the days of Solomon, so that now in Samaria, they're eating their children rather than trying to figure out who they belong to. However, by the end of the story, in chapter 7, we do see relief. We see a reprieve as the siege is lifted. The Arameans end up slaughtering each other and the price of food drops drastically because there's so much of it, fulfilling a prophecy by Elisha that the captain who doubted that God could actually feed the people of Samaria is trampled to death in the gates. However, that doesn't mean that Israel begins to turn back to God, even though there's a reprieve. Instead, they continue to follow after false gods, foreign gods, and continue to worship the Baals. However, there is a little bit of a reprieve that takes place in chapter 7. In chapter 8, though, we find out about the various successions that are going to take place in Israel and in Judah, setting the stage for the destruction of the family of Ahab. We also see uh, Hazael murdering Ben-Hadad. There's a lot of Ben-Hadads in Aram. Ben-Hadad is the commander uh, of the armies of Hazael, and Hazael is also serving a Ben-Hadad. So we have two Ben-Hadads. Hazael here will murder Ben-Hadad, but eventually a different Ben-Hadad will take over for Hazael. So you're forgiven if you're slightly confused by this. But here, in this particular instance, Elisha is telling the king of Aram is going to die, not because he's going to die of the disease that he has, but because he's going to be murdered by Hazael, which creates a very interesting situation because it sounds very much like God, through Elisha, just told Hazael to go murder his master. Uh, It's, again, a very perplexing situation as Hazael is taking matters into his own hands and becoming king. Eventually, like I said, we'll see a Ben-Hadad replace him. Chapter 8 also continues to tell us about some interaction with the uh, Shunammite, uh, the one whom he was living with. She has lost her land, and instead she gets it back. What's interesting in chapter 8 is that Gehazi is back in the picture, and yet in chapter 5 we saw that he had leprosy. This is telling us that these chapters are not in chronological order, but again, Just as we've seen in other books, they're in an illogical order in order to make a theological point. We needed to have that story of Naaman earlier on to highlight the oddity of Naaman coming and being delivered of his leprosy 
and yet also making war against the very nation that delivered him. So even though Naaman is thrilled to death that the God of Israel healed him, it would appear that he continues to fight against Israel in the coming years. Chapters 9 through 12 of 2 Kings are one of the larger chunks in the book. They take us from Jehu to Joash, a number of kings, a number of generations here, at least four generations in the north, several generations in the south. Jehu slaughters the family of Ahab, also precipitates the situation in Judah where we have a queen, Queen Athaliah, as she murders off all of her grandsons in order to reign as queen. Jehu having killed her son when he killed all the descendants of Ahab in the north. Jehu will continue to serve God, and yet he's not totally righteous because he doesn't remove the golden calves that Jeroboam set up. After several generations, Joash, the great-great-grandson of Jehu, will come to power. In 2 Kings 13, we read that there's continued decline in the northern kingdom, not that this really surprises us, as we've continued to see decline again and again and again. We do see Elisha actually dying in chapter 13, which just adds to the fact that there is decline in Israel. Hazael, who Elisha had appointed as king over Aram, is continuing to oppress Israel. And yet we're told that the Lord was gracious to Israel and was unwilling to destroy them or banish them from his presence although that is coming. That's going to happen. We read at the end of chapter 13 that Ben-Hadad is the son of Hazael, a different Ben-Hadad again from the Ben-Hadad that Hazael murdered. We also read that three times that King Jehoash captured the some of the cities that had been taken by Hazael. Jehoash is beginning a transition in Israel's history of a time of prosperity, a time of real flourishing. However, this is going to be short-lived. It really reaches its peak in chapter 14 with the reign of King Jeroboam II. This is really the high point in the northern kingdom's history in terms of their prosperity, and yet from here to the end, it's going to be pretty much downhill. This is really a reprieve in the continued decline in that we're not seeing the results of the decline, and yet we are still declining. So it's not a reprieve in the sense that we've stopped declining spiritually. We are still most certainly declining spiritually, but we're not seeing the consequences of that. And yet we find out that it's being stored up, and because of that, uh, we're going to eventually reach the end. And yet we're getting these reprieves here that are trying to get Israel's attention. We saw the reprieve under Jehoash. We find another reprieve here in chapter 14 with Jeroboam II. The Lord had said in verse 27 that he would not blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. And so he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. And yet again, we are headed towards the end fairly quickly. In chapter 15, really through chapter 17, we are rushing towards the end. We do have some notes on what's going on in Judah, and yet as well as things are going in Judah with the reign of Ahaz, although Ahaz will eventually set up a foreign altar to the Lord in the temple, but aside from some of those things, Judah is actually flourishing and staying fairly focused on God spiritually. However, Israel in the north is not, and by the end of chapter 17, they have indeed gone off into exile uh, under the reign of the Assyrians, having been taken out in 722 BC. This then is the end of the story of the north, and yet the story of the south will continue for several more chapters. 2 Kings 18 through 21 is another chunk in the book of 2 Kings dealing with Hezekiah. Hezekiah is well known for several uh, miraculous events that take place. Uh, the destruction of the Assyrian army under Sennacherib or Sennacherib, as well as the sundial moving backwards or the steps moving backwards as a sign that Hezekiah is going to live another 15 years. As miraculous as the siege and the lifting of the siege of the Assyrians is, we forget the fact that pretty much 
every single town in Judah was destroyed with the exception of Jerusalem. Lachish, which was not that far, is very uh, famously depicted in a mural uh, by the Assyrians showing their destruction of the land of Israel. Not sure that they really thought of it as two kingdoms. They kind of seem to think of it all as the same, and they wipe it all out until they come to Jerusalem, and then God preserves them. Uh, we need to keep in mind that for a long time, the Israelites actually served the Assyrians, and it's under Hezekiah that they begin to revolt because they trust in God to save them. And God does save them, but there's a lot of destruction that takes place in Judah before that salvation actually comes. We see basically Sennacherib coming and mocking God, and then Hezekiah turning in faith to God and saying, did you hear this? God says yes. Isaiah says that God is going to deliver Israel, and that's exactly what he does. Again, in chapter 20, we read about the boil that Hezekiah has, of which he's going to die, and yet he cries out to God and asks to be saved, and he is indeed spared for a time. We also see some envoys from Babylon. Uh, at the time, Marduk Baladan is the king of Babylon. He comes and he takes a look at everything that's going on in Israel, and Hezekiah is happy to show him. And yet a prophet tells him that actually, eventually, the people are going to go into Babylon. Although Hezekiah thinks that's not so bad because he figures he's going to be dead by the time that that happens. One other uh, interesting fact that's mentioned at the end of chapter 20 is that Hezekiah made a pool and a tunnel to bring water into the city. You can actually go to Israel and tour this particular tunnel if you so desire. What's really fascinating, though, is that Hezekiah has a son named Manasseh who will be the most wicked king in Israel. And we find out about Manasseh in chapter 21. We don't see anything good come out of Manasseh, although we do find out that Manasseh will repent, although we find that out from the book of Chronicles. As chapter 21 ends, it just seems to be bad, bad, and more bad. But then in chapter 22, we get Josiah. And actually, 22 and 23 will tell us about Josiah. And one wonders what would have happened had Josiah remained the king of Israel, He's the one that finds the book of the law in the temple because he's having the temple repaired. And yet, unfortunately, uh, the Egyptians are going through Israel on their way to Carchemish to join with the Assyrians to fight against the Babylonians, where both the Assyrians and the Egyptians will get their butts kicked by the Babylonians, which pretty much ends Egypt's domination of the western part of the Levant, in the ancient Near East, the land of Israel. We also see Israel going out and fighting against Pharaoh Necho as he's making his way to Carchemish. Necho warns him not to, and yet he does, and Necho ends up killing Josiah. One again wonders what would have happened if Josiah had continued to live. Would he have continued his reforms? Would he have led Israel in righteousness? It's hard to tell. Because as soon as he dies, and as soon as they begin to set up other kings, Israel quickly goes back and follows after the foreign gods that they were serving. Jehoahaz is the oldest son of Josiah. Jehoahaz becomes the king, and he doesn't reign very long, only three months. Pharaoh Necho is on his way back from Carchemish, having been defeated, he goes into Jerusalem, takes uh, Jehoahaz, puts him in chains, and takes him to Egypt. Pharaoh Necho then makes Eliakim, the son of Josiah, the second son, king in place of Josiah, and changes Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. Jehoahaz, though the oldest, is carried off to Egypt, and there he dies. Uh, Jehoiakim continues to serve under Pharaoh Necho's uh, suzerain uh, relationship. Uh, basically, Israel is a vassal state to the Egyptians, with Pharaoh Necho being the suzerain or the feudal lord, as it were. Uh, Jehoiakim will reign for 11 years. Uh, after uh, he dies, uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes and invades, uh, the uh, Jehoiakim dies, and Jehoiakin uh, 
is his son, succeeds him. Uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, comes and takes Jehoiakim captive to uh, Babylon and takes another descendant of Josiah's family, uh, Mataniah. Mataniah is actually Jehoiakim's uncle, so this would be Josiah's brother. Nebuchadnezzar changes the name of Mataniah to Zedekiah, which is a very unusual name choice since that means Yahweh is righteous which makes us question how much Nebuchadnezzar really understands about what's going on. He seems to have more insight than perhaps we would assume from a Babylonian king. I would guess that's from the influence of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. Zedekiah will reign in Israel for 11 years. He shows up quite a bit in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Zedekiah will revolt against uh, King Nebuchadnezzar foolishly. Not really sure why he thought that was a good idea, but that's what he does. Even though Jeremiah keeps telling him he needs to actually surrender to the Babylonians, Zedekiah continues to fight against Nebuchadnezzar, and eventually Nebuchadnezzar will sack the entire city of Jerusalem. They will break down the walls. They will burn the temple. They will take everybody in captivity off to Babylon in exile. You would think this is where the book is going to end because we don't hear much about a return the way that we hear at the end of the book of Second Chronicles, but we do have a positive note at the very end of the book. We're told that Jehoiakim comes out of prison and sits at the king's table, which on the one hand is somewhat shaming because it shows he's been defeated. On the other hand, it's also a positive because he's no longer in prison. Eventually, Jehoiakim, it appears, will die of old age. One wonders, because this is the ending of the book, if the writer of Kings is saying, here's an element of hope, but is it also possible that the writer of Kings does not yet know of a return from exile? And so he's in exile telling us about the continued exile, but telling us that there's this small element of hope. Jehoiakim has been replaced from prison. Maybe there is hope after all. And yet as the book of Second Kings ends, the people are still in captivity in Babylon. The Assyrian uh, destination of several of the tribes of Israel. Israel is no longer to be seen. They're mixed in completely. There are Samaritans that have taken the place of Israel in Samaria. Half-breeds of all the other nations that are mixed in with Israel here in Samaria. And we have the rest of the tribes, really the two tribes, Judah, parts of Benjamin and Levi, that are in Babylon. It seems as though this is the end and there's no hope, and yet we know the rest of the story and we know that they will eventually return. But it is a reminder that God is serious when he says that there's a punishment. There is a serious punishment here. There is the exile exactly as he foretold. They thought that would never happen, and yet it's exactly how it happens. So really, in the book of Second Kings, we see the book start bad and just continually get worse and worse and worse, except with some of these reprieves. So there is a reprieve even at the end of the book. There is hope, a reminder that God is still active and God is still at work. And yet Israel doesn't have a whole lot of hope that this is going to turn out well for them. They're in exile and they don't even know that there's ever going to be a chance to go back. For all most of Israel knows, this is the end. They will forever be Babylonians. Especially when Jeremiah writes them a letter in Jeremiah 29 and says they should seek the good of the city of Babylon because they're going to be there for a while. Uh, we don't find out until later on in the book of Daniel that Daniel is the one who figures out that it's only going to be 70 years, and yet here in 2 Kings, we don't even know that yet, that it's only going to be 70 years. Instead, we think that this is permanent. So it really ends on a low note, and were it not for Ezra and Nehemiah and really the end of 2 Chronicles, we would continue on that low note, thinking that God has completely abandoned Israel. Well, that brings us to the end of our eighth lecture, a little bit shorter, just because there's not a whole lot in Kings other than this downward spiral. We do have a couple of textual issues that we'll talk about, especially related to Elisha's statement of go in peace, but also some other interesting quirks of the text that we'll examine in slightly more detail in class. But this has given us a good overview of the book of Second Kings and how it continues to trudge downhill, very much like the book of Judges, except that Judges ends anticipating David. This book ends anticipating, well, not anticipating much at all. 
We know that the Davidic king, Jehoiakim, has been released from prison, so maybe the Davidic line will continue as was promised. But beyond that, there's not a whole lot of hope left for Israel. It's a pretty hopeless situation. Hopefully, though, Israel will get back together, which they indeed do while they're in Babylon. And when they return, they'll be a little bit more interested in pursuing God.